It's another Q&A edition of Optimal Health Daily, episode 820, and I'm Dr. Neil, your host of the show. Welcome back to another Friday show where I play your questions and simply answer them. On all the other days, I read health and fitness blogs to you like an audiobook, and with permission from the authors, of course. Now, I've been listening to this audiobook called Principles, which was written by Ray Dalio. Now, if you're not familiar with who Ray Dalio is, he's actually founder of the world's biggest hedge fund firm, Bridgewater Associates, which manages $160 billion. And one of the quotes that I listened to recently jumped out at me. Ray Dalio said, listening to uninformed people is worse than having no answers at all. And so I love doing these Friday Q&A episodes because I'm hoping that you have trust in what I say. I hope you consider me informed. And if you're wondering, is Dr. Neil just a nickname or do you actually have your doctoral degree in something? Well, yes, I do have my Doctor of Public Health degree with an emphasis in chronic disease prevention and nutrition. I also have my Master of Public Health degree with an emphasis in health promotion and health education. I'm also a registered dietitian nutritionist, a certified health education specialist, and a certified exercise physiologist through the American College of Sports Medicine. I always say when I'm not doing this podcast, I actually hold three faculty positions at various higher level institutions, one of which I've served as department chair. I presented at national conferences and have been quoted in over 70 different media outlets regarding my expertise in fitness, nutrition, lifestyle, exercise science, you know, all the stuff I talk about on this show. So again, I'm hoping you feel like you're getting good information from this show. And I'm gonna let you know at the end how you can send in your own question. But for now, let's get right to it and start optimizing your life. Hello, Dr. Neil. It's a pleasure um, listening to your podcast. I've learned a lot over the past few months. Um, My question was, can you tell me more about pesticides and human health? What foods to watch out for mainly and How often are people affected by pesticides and what exactly are these symptoms and how do you know for sure that it's due to pesticides? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Emily. And thank you for listening and for your kind words. I'm so glad you appreciate the show. Now, a while back, one of my Q&A episodes was all about those foods we should consider buying organic. Oh, and before I get started, I must mention that what I'm sharing is specific to the United States. Each country has their own set of standards regarding pesticide use. In Europe, for example, many of the pesticides that are approved here in the U.S. are banned there. Emily, you asked if there are certain foods to watch out for. As part of my response back in that other Q&A episode, I talked about the Environmental Working Group's lists of foods. Those that are highest in pesticide residues and those that are lowest. The Environmental Working Group calls their list of foods highest in pesticide residues, the dirty dozen, and those with the fewest pesticide residues, the clean 15. My recommendation was to try and purchase organic foods, especially if that food landed on the dirty dozen list. This is because researchers are discovering that those that purchase organic foods do have lower levels of pesticides in their bodies. So just so we're all caught up, Here are the foods I would watch out for because these made the Environmental Working Group's 2019 Dirty Dozen list. These foods include strawberries, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, and potatoes. Now, you may have noticed that this list only includes fruits and vegetables. So, I also recommended people consider buying organic animal products like meat, eggs, poultry, milk, and especially fish and shellfish because of the potential for increased pesticide exposure in animal-based foods. This is because of a concept called biomagnification. What happens is as we move up the biological chain from fruits and vegetables to animal products, the potential for pesticide exposure increases. Besides types of foods, we also need to consider how frequently these foods are consumed and in what quantities. For example, kale is found on this list of the dirty dozen, meaning it typically contains lots of pesticide residues. So if you eat kale fairly regularly year-round, then I would suggest you purchase certified organically grown kale. But if, on the other hand, you hardly ever eat kale, 
then it may not be a big deal to purchase a variety that is conventionally grown. So think about the foods that you consume quite often and then consider switching to purchasing a certified organic version if you can. Emily, you also wondered how many people are affected by pesticides and if there are any health consequences from being exposed to too many of these chemicals. Well, unfortunately, it's hard to know exactly how many individuals are exposed to pesticides at any given time. As I mentioned before, if someone eats mostly organically grown food, they probably have fewer pesticide residues in their bodies when compared with someone who eats food that is more conventionally grown. For example, imagine there were two versions of you, one in this universe and an alternate bizarro world version of Emily. Let's say the version of you in this universe is all about eating organically grown everything, fruits, vegetables, animal products, grains, everything. But the bizarro world version of you only ate conventionally grown foods. What we would probably discover is that the bizarro world version of you, the version that didn't eat organic, would have higher levels of detectable pesticide residues. Unfortunately, there's no way though to avoid all pesticides. So even if you were perfect and made sure to purchase all organic everything, you would still be exposed to pesticides. That's because they're often used not just in agriculture, but in things like bug sprays and rodenticides in our homes and offices. Oh, and you may be wondering how scientists test for pesticide exposure. There are a few ways to do this, but the most common is by testing a person's urine. So, how much exposure is too much exposure? Unfortunately, we don't really have an answer. Various U.S. governmental agencies have created guidelines for certain chemicals and have established thresholds. But these thresholds are based on animal studies and certain pesticides are more harmful in the short term than others. There are so many different chemicals that are used in pesticides, it makes it really hard to tell. Others are less harmful in the short term, but may be a problem over years and years of exposure. So there isn't a clear recommendation for all pesticides across the board. We don't know exactly what level of pesticide exposure will lead to cancer, for example. Again, part of the reason for this is because that most studies linking pesticide exposure to diseases were performed in animals, not humans. Most scientists appear to agree, though, that we probably want to limit pesticide exposure in younger children and women that are pregnant. The risk for complications due to pesticides seem to be highest in these groups specifically. Now, is it possible to tell if you've been exposed to too many pesticides? Yes, but I should mention that overexposure usually happens in those that work in the farming or agriculture industries. Pesticide poisoning is not super common in those outside of these industries. And even if it does happen, a doctor may not suspect that pesticide exposure is to blame. This is because the signs and symptoms of pesticide poisoning aren't very telling. A person may experience maybe gastrointestinal distress or come in with a respiratory infection or even something like pink eye. All of these conditions could be caused by so many things besides pesticides. And from the data I have seen, there are only two known deaths due to overexposure to pesticides. Even so, the scientists couldn't be sure with these deaths if it was really the pesticides or a combination of other factors like the patient's ages and their health histories. So the bottom line, Emily, is this. Yes, it's a good idea to reduce your pesticide exposure as much as possible. Let's err on the side of caution and reduce our exposure as often as we can. One way to do this is to consider buying organic or locally grown foods. Why locally grown? Well, in theory, if the food came from somewhere local to you, then the growers didn't need to try and preserve it as long. Hopefully, they picked it and got it to you in a relatively short period of time, which reduces the need for pesticides. Okay, but let's say you're not able to purchase organically grown and or local foods all the time. So what you do is, when you start your meal preparation, rinse and scrub the fruits and vegetables especially those with thin peels or thin skins. Do this under cool running water. Researchers have found that water and friction are pretty darn effective at removing most pesticides on our produce. But please know you do not need to do the same when preparing meat, fish, and poultry. That actually can spread bacteria all over your kitchen. Instead, again, for animal products, try and purchase certified organic. These tips will hopefully help reduce your exposure significantly. Thank you again for the question, Emily. You'll be entered into a very small raffle every month to win a book. 
And if you want to be in the raffle, send me a question. Just come by oldpodcast.com slash ask to do that. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way and call in your question. The number is 61 I love OHD. Both methods are in this episode's description, which you can find at oldpodcast.com. All right, that'll do it for this week. Thank you for listening every day. Thank you for listening all the way through. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on Monday where your optimal life awaits.